This is Larry Lawton, and he's an ex-jewel thief. Larry's a former career criminal, once considered the biggest jewel thief in the United States. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here is part three of chapter 10, An Atmosphere of Violence. This will be the last part of this chapter. I hope you're enjoying it. Let's get right to it. At the end of the last chapter, I was talking about drunk getting drunk and making wine and stuff. What do you think happens when all these people in prison get drunk? I mean, people at life sentences don't care. People get killed. There's nothing but shanks and fights and, and, and who owes who. And before you know it, uh, somebody got killed. And that, that happens more than you think. And, and, and that's part of, uh, I, I partly think the prison don't care. If prisoners are killing themselves, they're not worried about escaping or somebody, uh, you know, killing a guard or something like that. And that's what their own goal is. They've told me that before. Hey, listen, I had a good shift. If no one escaped and no one got killed. That's, that's what a guard said to me, and uh, I believe him, obviously. A matter of fact, it got so bad in a Colorado prison, it was called the Supermax. These, uh, they had a crowded cell, and it wasn't in the Supermax, but it was in Colorado USP. Uh, they have a Colorado USP and the Supermax there as well. Well, in Colorado USP, uh, they had three inmates to a cell. And two of them had life sentence. The one guy had a, had a bank robbery charge and he had 10 years and he was close to the door, they call that. He was real close to the door. So they got drunk in the cell and what happens? The two inmates, they were brothers I even think, the two guys with life sentences killed the, killed the bank robber and such sick stuff, they cut his intestines out of his body and they actually put the intestines around the door window. I mean, think about that. that you talk about sick and psychopaths. They actually put his intestines around the door, the window of the door. I mean, they just totally went, you know, crazy. I mean, you know. So, obviously, I'm not a model inmate. I'm, I'm involved in a lot of stuff. Meaning, you know, not, again, I was survival. I was, uh, at the, I went into prison at 34 years old. So, I was about 35 years old at this time. And uh, I'm surviving Atlanta. I mean, the worst of the worst. And uh, I get caught with a shank. They did a shell, cell shakedown, and I get caught with a shank, and they send me to the hole. Well, they had a lieutenant in the hole in Atlanta called Cartret. Never forget him. The guy was from New York City. You want to talk about a brutal asshole. I heard later on he found God or something, and I hope he did. But I'm telling you how bad it was. He he had a goon squad, and they were sued many times. You can look them up in, in the court systems and everything else, in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and 11th Circuit is the federal circuit where Atlanta is. And uh, Cartret was the lieutenant, and he was the head of the hole. And he would beat you, and his goon squad would beat you so bad. Man, I'm getting goosebumps. I don't even like talking about it, but... Uh, I got beaten so bad there. Uh, I, I'm laying in a fetal position. You know, the, you know. a lot of people ask me, you know, how is it to get beaten like that? And I'll tell you what the worst part is. It's not the actual beating that, that gets you. It's the, take it, the, it's the anticipation of the beating. Uh, you know you're going to be beaten. They don't come to your cell and say, lock up. Lock up means you turn around, you put your hands behind your back and, and you do this and you put your hands through and they cuff you up. Because whenever you're in the shoe or the hole, whenever you leave your cell, you have to be cuffed up. That's just the way it is. And that's the way the law is, um, prison policy, whatever you want to call it. And they, they, they just don't do that. When, when, they, when you know you're going to get a beating, they come down the cell and all the, I mean, I was beaten bad in Lewisburg, but in Atlanta, I was beaten so bad by Cartwright's people, I thought I was gonna die. I was pissing blood for weeks. I mean, I, I, I could barely move, my, my jaw didn't work, my hands, my, my ribs, every time I moved or hurt, they were just injured. I mean, it's so bad, I, it was amazing what, what they did to you. And it was that coming in and that hearing them come down the cell and you hear, of getting ready outside your cell. 
Now what they do is they actually take covers and put them over everybody else's window so that people can't see what they're doing to you. They're, they're beating people so bad. Our prison system, it, I'm telling you how much this is a big thing of me and, and, and thank you for your support because when I get a platform, I am going to expose some sh that goes on in prison system and ways to fix it too. I don't want to just be a bitcher. I do have ways that can fix it. So you can't fight. I love that thing. Oh, like I remember I was so out of it and so whacked out. Here they come, goon squads, and they got the helmets on and the vests on and the electric shield. I've been shocked. I've been concussion grenaded. I was in the hole and I started going crazy. So as I'm going crazy, I would do crazy things. I mean, I wouldn't lock, lock up. I'd be cursing them out. I flooded my cell. I did some sick things because I was literally going crazy. So they come up to my cell and they said, lock up, lock up, f you. I know what you're going to do, f you. So what do they do? They open the shoot door and they mace me right in the face. <laughs> I love it when people say, oh, I can handle it. They maced me. I went on the floor. I'm snots coming out of my nose. I'm in a fetal position. They take you out. Next time, I know they're going to do that. So what do I do? I put a, uh, the mattress I had against the door. And I covered the window. I covered my window so they can't look in the cell. They hate that. They hate that. So I cover the cell so they can't look in. And they're saying, take it down. I'm f you. Take it. I'm, I'm nuts already. And I put the, the mattress up against the, the door, the whole door, so they can't squirt me from mace with the shoot door. They call it a shoot door. Food slot door. So what do they do? They take a broom handle, they push that in, and they drop a concussion grenade. If anybody ever knows what a concussion grenade is, a concussion grenade, I mean, I, all I know is I was a down, boom. It, it, it knocks your equilibrium, it does something, you boom, I go down. I am like, you want to talk out of it, I'm out of it. I'm just in the fetal position. Another time they come in there and, they, and those shields they have, they have a thing on them and they shock you. They shock you. I mean, you, 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 you know, it's, again, it's another thing that messes you up and you're just screwed up with all this stuff. It's, it's crazy. So while you're in the hole for long periods of time, you learn how to do things in the hole that make you sane. And here's one of them. When we go through the workout, but we used to make things. And what I mean by make things, the first thing I would do is they give you a razor blade every two or three days. If you want to shave, they'll give it, sometimes it's once a week, but you get to shave and it's a little big plastic razor. So that razor that comes in that thing is worth, I hate to say worth money. It's good to have. You could sharpen your pencil with it. You could uh, cut sheet with it. You could cut rope. You can do a lot of things. You know, you can make things. You could cut your paper different ways. There's a lot of things you can do with a little, little, little raisin, a little, little raisin that comes in those things. But here's what they do. When they give you a raisin, they mark it at your door, and in an hour they come by and they want their razor back. And they'll look at the razor and they'll throw it in a bag. So they'll give it through the chute and they'll look at the razor, make sure the razor's in it, and throw it in the bag. Huh. Inmates are pretty smart. Here's what we did. When we were getting magazines, we would look for a page or an advertisement that had like a silver background, glossy or silver background. So we would take that razor apart in the back. You could literally take a little, there's three little knobs in the back, you take them off, you take the top of the razor, you take that out, then you use the razor to cut an exact shape of that razor. And you put that in back, in there and you can s secure that cover back over with toothpaste. Toothpaste, when it dries, is like glue. Trust me, we used to use it for everything. It's like glue. The, the, we, we call it, at least the state, you know, the federal uh, or the state, they call state toothpaste. It's these little tubes and it's literally like glue. So you put a little dab there and you put your cover back on over the razor blade. And then the cop looks at it and he, he looks, he sees, like, thinks there's a razor in there, and he throws it in a bag. Now you got your razor. You used to have razors all over the place. And they were good for, again, cutting things or especially sharpening pencils. That was the biggest deal in the world. 
And then you're cutting your razor, you cut the tube, you can cut an old uh, 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 toothpaste tube so you can make what they call a, a rope kite. So also, so you got a razor blade, you also used to make kites. Kite is you take sheet and you cut it real thin and you put it together so it might be 20 or 30 feet long. Then you take a toothpaste, you take all the toothpaste out of it, but it's still heavy. You put a hole in it and with a pencil or with something and use it a razor and you put the sheet through it and now that's a weight. Now under the doors in, in the prison, there's about this much space, about an inch of space that's open. Even the prison put some uh, rubber things on that and inmates learned to cut those off with razors. We'd cut those off. But anyway, I'd be, I would be able to make a kite. Now, what that is for is I would take that and I would shoot that under the door and I would get it to another cell. And that guy would either pass me magazines or pass me a candy bar or pass me something under the door. Because guards don't just do it for you. Oh, pass this, pass this. They don't give a shit about you. So wait, shoot that. I used to be able to shoot that kite way down the hall. Another guy would shoot his kite and catch the line and bring that line to him. And we would have a, literally a line going back and forth. It was amazing what we can do uh, with having that technolo technology, having the, that, where we, I call us, we were MacGyvers. I used to be able to make a rope, a rope out of the underwear, the elastic in the underwear. You take that out with the razor again, having that razor blade. You take the elastic out. All of that is cotton going down that stretches. That's cotton. So I would take that cotton and retwine it against, with with a spinner and everything else against the, the uh, bunk bed that the stanch and tie a piece in. I would make a rope that was as, uh, is so strong, thick, thick rope. You can make it as thick as you want, as many how many underwear you steal. And you, you get from the laundry when they change them. And I would have rope. I'd make rope. You can use rope for the kite. It's better. It's rope. It's lighter than the sheet. And it would fly. And it was very easy to like just roll up and boom. And then you could shoot that. So I'd use it for that. Or you, people actually made those rope and hung themselves. And, you know, it's sad. But, uh, you know, I had friends hang themselves. And uh, I'll tell you a sad story. It breaks my heart every time I think about it. A friend of mine, Jack, uh, he's in he's in a cell next to me. Now, we used to work out, too. Uh, I used to do sick workout routines. I used to do 600 push-ups, 600 crunches in 40 minutes. Then I got up to 1,000. Then I used to do uh, a burpees. I would do a routine called 5-4-3-2 routine, which means a burpee is when you go down, you do a push-up, kick your feet out, jump up, jump down. Boom, jump out, jump down, jump up. That's one, boom, one, two. I would do what they call 25 fives, 25 fours, 25 threes, 25 twos, 25 ones. It's such a hard routine. When I got out of prison, I was in such shape. I'm going to show pictures of you in this. You'll see now the picture. When I got out of prison, I bet dudes who do this, you know, CrossFit and all that kind of stuff that they couldn't do to five, four, five, four, three, two, one burpee routine. Nobody ever did it. We used to do it. I used to, the Mexicans used to do it in tandem. They, they started all this. They were amazing at it. But I got in such shape when I was in prison uh, that I, I kept sane by getting in shape and I would do these crazy routines. That burpee routine, you do it in your underwear in the hall. And your underwear, after you, after you do that, you could wring out your underwear. It'd be like you were just in a shower. That's how much. It was just crazy. So anyway, I'm in the cell, and I'm in my own cell, and there's a cellie next to me, and I'll never forget, he was a guy in the yard named Jack. Jack, And Jack was a good friend. He was a black guy, and we used to get along, and we used to do the burpee routines in the hall. We'd talk through a vent, because in the prison, you could literally talk to the next cellmate in a vent, or if it's like quiet, I could just talk like I am now, and the sound goes right through the vent. So here it is about 3.30 in the afternoon. We did our workout. We did all stuff, Jack and I. And all of a sudden, I'm laying in my bed. I'm getting ready for 4 o'clock count because even in the hole, you have to stand on your feet. Every inmate in federal prison is standing on their feet 
at uh, 4 p.m. every day, no matter where you are, you're locked in your cell. Every inmate. It's called a national 4 p.m. count. So uh, even in a hole, they make you. And the reason they do that is because they once counted a guy like three days and he was dead in his bunk until the smell made them realize. So anyway, Jack uh, says to me in the van, he goes, hey, buddy, I'm checking out. I love you, brother. And I'm like, where the f*** you going? You're in the hole. You f***ing, you're in the hole with me. You ain't going to f***. And we had a life sentence. It dawned on me. The fucking light bulb goes off on my head. I jump up out of my bunk and I get up on the steel toilets. I get up there and I talk right in the vent. And I said, hey, Jack, lay down. I'll talk to you after the count, man. Brother, nothing's that bad. Lay down. And he doesn't say anything. And here at four o'clock come counts. And at the end of the tier, you hear count time, count time. And you got to get up and, you know, it's count time. So you get up, all you do is you stand on your feet. When they walk by your cell, you just lay down, do whatever the fuck you were doing. So anyway, they go by my cell after I stood up and I, and I hear them stop at his cell. They, they, they talk into their radio, they hit their deuces, man down, man down. And sure enough, uh, Jack was dead in his cell. He hung himself, he hung himself in his cell. And I'll never forget it because it breaks my heart. The dude was a good dude. I used to get mad at him because he had such a good body because he could eat an ice cream on the yard and have this ripped eight pack. And I, and I just couldn't do that. I don't have that kind of body. And in any way, Jack, they, they take Jack out of the cell. And all they do when someone dies in prison, they leave. They just recount like it's nothing. And, and man, I'll tell you what, that broke my heart. And, uh, I think about that dude a lot, and, uh, you know, that could have been me, and uh, it, 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 it f***s me up sometimes, because, you know, nobody deserves to die like that alone in a prison cell, you know, nothing, and, and it, it, man, that's a tough one, Jack, he, he, nobody deserves that, that's just f***ed up, and, and I've, what I've seen, the deaths and sh in prison, it just breaks my heart. And that's why I, I, I don't want people to make the mistakes I make, you know, and, and it just, matter of fact, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, my tattoos, you know, I have tattoos all over, all my body. And uh, my tattoos mean something. I have no gang tattoos. I was never in a gang, but my tattoos mean something. I have my, uh, my nephew who, who kill, got killed on the street, 24 years old. Got his tattoo on me. I got other tattoos of where I was. I have a tattoo on my leg of a celly who died, and he did a s screwed up tattoo, and I'll never fix it. And if you ever see me, just ask me about that tattoo. And uh, that, it blows me away. But, you know, people say, how do you make tattoos in prison? It's crazy. You know, I'll tell you, you, you take, I'll tell you a quick way to make a tattoo gun and then the ink. You take a toothbrush, you heat the toothbrush like the, the, the toothbrush is this way, you heat it and you bend it. Now your toothbrush is in an L. You take a barrel of a pen and you put it on top, just the barrel. You steal a motor again off a typewriter or off a pencil sharpener and you, you attach that, just tape it to the other L of the uh, uh, toothbrush. So now you got the battery here with the little, uh, the motor here with the little thing sticking up. You got a barrel of a pen. So what do you use for a needle? You can use a guitar string. You file down a thick guitar string. They're really thick and hard. And you file it to a serious point and you run it through that, through that uh, uh, barrel of the pen. And how do you attach it to a stick sticking up? Just a little thing that goes like this on the top of a motor. How do you stick it there? Well, the pen cartridge where the ink is in a pen, that's a little round thing. You used to cut it with that razor blade you cut just a little piece and you put it over that. You bend that end of the guitar string into that little plastic piece and that will turn and this thing will go back. And the, and, the bzzz, and you have a tattoo gun. You literally have a tattoo gun. Now, what do you do for ink? You melt chess pieces. We would melt chairs, plastic chairs we'd melt. Also, the black guys in prison would buy hair grease off the commissary. So when they bought the higher hair grease, they would burn it and black soot would come up. We'd catch that on loose leaf and, and, and put that into uh, water, dilute it, and that would be 
the ink that's in my body. I mean, I watched the guy get MRSA from that and die. Because in prison, they don't give a shit about health care at all. And uh, so he, he actually died in prison. And uh, that, that blows me away. So back and out, I get out of the hole. I'm in Atlanta. And <laughs> kind of funny story, but it, it, a serious story. I, I go to D-Unit. Now, I'm in the D-Unit TV room watching. You're not supposed to be there, but everybody went everywhere in, in Atlanta. It was a fucking zoo. So I'm in D-Unit, and I'm, I'm with a bunch of the Italian guys, and we're watching. Matter, matter of fact, that was Vic Arena's unit. So I'm in D-Unit, and we're watching TV in the TV room. I got my chair up against the back wall, and it gives a guy in front of us. We know him, but nothing big that we don't know him. So in comes a dude. And he stabs this dude in the neck. Bam! He stabs him right in the neck. And like, whoa, we're like, what happened? And, and we, you don't say anything. You just back up and you get out of there. So he stabs him. This guy doesn't go, I mean, die. And he turns around. He's got a shank sticking out of his neck. And he starts fighting with this guy. Well, there was a woman guard. I'll never forget. She was on. And she heard the commotion. She came up to the door. We're outside the door now looking in. She closes the door, screaming, you know, lockdown. She closes the door and locks it. Now, these two are fighting inside that, inside the TV room. Well, a punk, a mad, badass punk, comes, takes the guard, throws the guard on the floor, takes the keys off the guard, opens the door and goes in there and beats this guy with a lock. The punk thought that his boyfriend was getting beat with by this other guy and it wasn't his but it was funny because we're watching at the end out comes the guy with the, the the shank he's laying on a he's laying flat stomach down on a stretch he's got the shank sticking out of his neck out comes the next guy who did the shanking he's all bloodied up from the lock beat and he took and out comes the punk in handcuffs literally in handcuffs and we're like what the Dude, this is a sick place, this fucking Atlanta. And and it was just that crazy, you know? So another time, we're sitting there and looking at the unit. We're standing on the tier. That's what we used to do. Just sit down, sometimes smoke cigars, bullshit, whatever, before count, what before a visit, whatever you're waiting for, hanging out. And we used to play a lot of pinochle and cards and stuff like that. So we're sitting on the tier, and all of a sudden we hear commotion. And we, we don't know what's going on. It's a big argument. So, okay, they, that's normal. But when it gets too loud, you know something bad's going to happen. This punk takes a bucket of water. Now, we used to make a bucket. You didn't buy, you didn't get buckets. We used to take a paint can, a five-gallon paint bucket. Think of what I ate at a, a five-gallon paint bucket. We'd, we'd cut it down like that high and it would be able to fit in the microwave they had. They had a microwave on the unit, one microwave on each side. That's it. So anyway, this punk takes a, a five-gallon bucket, puts boiling water, pu puts uh, water in it, puts a snicker bar in it, and olive oil in it. He puts it in a microwave and it boils, literally boils. Takes it out and throws it in this dude's face. To this day, I will never forget the screams I heard. Man, my, my, the screams I heard were uh, something you never heard of a, a man screaming. And he was screaming so loud. This oil and the chocolate and, and the caramel from the Snicker bar melted this dude's face. He was screaming. He goes that passes out, screamed. I mean, the screaming was amazing. This guy is over him just dumping the, every bit of water out there. If they threw it on, just dump it and cursing them and scream. Went nuts. A, a punk. A punk. I, I used to tell people, you go to prison, don't f*** with a punk. I don't care if you're gay or not. I could care less what you are. But it's not great because a punk is crazy. They, they had one punk they used to call the Black Widow. And it killed three of, three of the boyfriends, if you want to call it. I mean, they're crazy motherfuckers. I mean, you know, they do everything. There was a punk, Goldie, who used to do my laundry. Used to wear a shirt. Like, you know, you take a T-shirt and put it through and you can make a tie. Oh, my God. Wore a bandana like Aunt Jemima. Oh, my God. Used to have red lipstick. It was funny as f But a, a convict, you don't want to f with that person. That person will kill you. That person or the person they're fighting will kill you. 
And I often wondered, you know, a lot of the punks in prison, they're very thin and very, and, you know, the HIV, uh, especially back then, this is in now 97, 98, 99, I left there. You got to remember the fucking HIV rate was very high and Atlanta had a very high HIV rate. I think it was like 20% and the, and the hepatitis C, which they didn't know much about, was like 40%. So that means four out of 10 people had hepatitis C. And it's something that, you know, you can get. I mean, thank God in my life, I never had a disease, never even had the crabs in my life. So, I mean, I'm just blessed, I guess. I mean, lucky with all the fucking crazy shit I did in my life when I was fucking all the women and orgies and everything else. So, I mean, it was just, that that was just crazy. So, you know, thinking about Atlanta and thinking about how crazy it got and how people went crazy, you know, and I, and... That they totally did. So my cellmate was named, a guy named Dave. So Dave is in my cell. He's the one who used to go to get the, the sugar out of the kitchen. He used to wear size 13. He didn't wear 13, but he had it about a size 10 foot. And he'd get these 13 shoes out of the laundry. And he would stick the front of the whole shoe with sugar packets and, and wrapped up in bags, sugar. Because he would steal sugar. That was his hustle from the kitchen and sell it to the guys who are making the wine, either for wine or books of stamps or whatever. Well, Dave, he, he was a bank robber and he was my cellie after Lee Sharrow. So Dave, because when Lee went to the hole, I lost my cellie and if you lose your cellie, you gotta get another one. So Dave is my cellie and uh, so Dave, all of a sudden he was working his case for an appeal. So Dave works his case for the appeal and sure enough, he wins an appeal never forget he's sitting in i'm sitting in my cell and he comes in he goes and he's in shock and he looks he goes larry i want my appeal i'm going home they just called me to r d which is receiving and discharge i go what the fuck you doing get the fuck out of here he was in such shock he goes to his locker and he takes a laundry detergent you bought off the commissary he's putting it in a bag i go what the fuck are you doing he goes uh, maybe my mother doesn't have laundry detergent. I'm like, you know how fucked up you are in prison. You just, you, you, you totally lose it. You go institutionalized. And I said, get the fuck out of here. I mean, you won your appeal. He owed me money. I'll never forget. He owed me like a hundred bucks. And he goes, I'll pay you. I'll pay. I said, get the fuck out. I don't give about the fucking money you owe me. I said, just get the fuck out of here, man. I, mean, I couldn't believe him. He fucking... So sure enough, he goes to the receiving discharge. He only takes his legal work. I help him get that ready. And he gets his legal work, goes to R&D. Guess what? About a year and a half later, I'm in another prison and I hear Dave came back to prison. Dave fucking did another bank robbery and came back to prison, the same prison he was in. I said, these fucking people, I mean, it's such a shame that they get so institutionalized that they can't handle it on the free world. And I am... Lucky I did handle it on the free world. And I survived Atlanta, which is another big thing for me. So now Dave goes home. I've been there a while. I'm a convict. And all of a sudden, I get called to the counselor's office, Farley's office. Never forget, Farley goes, hey, Lawton, we did your paperwork. You can now qualify for a medium. You don't have the points to be in a penitentiary. We're going to be transferring you. I go, what? Are you a kid? I'm getting out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you think it's like, okay, now... Okay, you're getting out, but now you got all these life sentence dudes. You got a lot of people there that might be jealous of you or whatnot. So I got about 10 days to go to get out. I got my date that I'm going to leave on a bus. So um, we had, I'm up in the TV room. I put my chair. Every cell had chairs. So I take my cell chair and I put it in the TV room and I go heat something up in the microwave, some like soup, ramu noodle soup. I heat it up. I come back and Bonnie the Indian is in my chair. I say, Bonnie, get out of my fucking chair, man. You know it's my chair, but he uh, grumbles like that. He gets out of my chair, no big deal. So I'm sitting in my chair, I eat, and I get up. I go to my cell to bring in the bowl, uh, uh, my, my bowl. A bowl in your cup is like a big deal having that in prison. So I take the bowl and I bring it back to my cell and I come back and Bonnie's in my fucking chair again. And I said, Bonnie, what the fuck? And he starts grumbling. He goes, you fucking guys think you run this fucking prison. I used to hang out with all the Italians and everybody else. He you think you fucking run? When he did that, I hit him. Boom! I hit him with a 
an uppercut. He f***ing goes, hits his head against the wall. He starts going down. I grab his hair and I'm f***ing hit. I'm f***ing, I am pounding that motherfucker. I f***ed him up so bad. The head of the white boys, the Aryan Brotherhood, a guy named Randy, tapped me. And they don't do that in prison. And, and I look and it's Randy. He goes, enough, Larry. And, and, and I f***ing, I'm so f***ing hyped up. I, f***ing, I I literally drop Bonnie. He goes down. He wobbles up. His already, within minutes, his face, is, is, is it was so f***ed up, but he's an Indian, and it was all f***ed up, and he doesn't go to, he doesn't even go to medical, he needed stitches, I f***ed him up so bad in his mouth, it was so f***ing gap, they had f***ing bruises here, but you know, he wore a headband too, and he had bruises all in his f***ing thing, but now I'm saying, oh f***, Chief's coming off the yard, I'm f***ing dead, man, when you know, Chief is the guy who's the shot caller for the Indians. A big motherfucker, six foot six, you know, 300 pounds, this fucking monster. Chief, they call him. So, what has happened? So, I fucking do it. I go back to my cell, and in comes Reno. Reno's a crazy motherfucker. He's got three life sentences. He's the head of the Latin Kings. He loved me because I taught him how to be a bookmaker, you know, be a, a bookie gambler. And he's he was crazy. Reno was a fucking crazy motherfucker. So, because Reno was so crazy, when someone owed Reno $40, these guys owed Reno $40. Matter of fact, these black guys owed Reno $40. So if you ever heard of the name Broderick Graves, Broderick Graves was a professional football player. He was in Atlanta with me, and he was a running back and a punt returner for the Philadelphia Eagles. He got jammed up by selling a few kilos for a gambling debt, and he ends up in Atlanta, Broderick Graves. Anyway, so Reno was so crazy. A guy owed him forty fucking dollars. So Reno was going after him to kill him with a fucking shank. This is how crazy Reno was. He even went after a guy in the gym, but they huddled around. And he couldn't get him. One time, the guy is in a the showers. They had the three showers up on the top, three in the shower, the bottom, and each side of the unit, and they had these little glass windows in the door that closed. So here's Reno. We're watching Reno go up the stairs with a fucking sword, like this big, a shank, you know, sword, we called it. And we know he's going after one of the guys in the fucking goddamn shower. Well, one of them wiped the, the fucking the condensation off the window and looked out and fucking sees Reno coming up and they bang the walls and all three black dudes come running out of their fucking cells naked. They go to their cells, you know, to get protection. And, and we're laughing our balls off. Reno's so fucking crazy. Matter of fact, Broderick Graves comes up to me and says, hey, hey, hey Lawton, I, I got to talk to you. I said, what's up, Rod? He goes, you got to fucking talk to Reno. He's crazy. He's, we'll, we'll pay the fucking money. They're going to pay. I go, man, you guys fuck with the wrong crazy fuck. You know, Reno is nuts. And they go, yeah, I know, man. Can you call him? I ended up calling Reno in. I said, hey, Reno, do you like it here? He goes, yeah, he's making 10000 a month. He's a fucking businessman. This guy's a crazy mother. He says, yeah, I'm making money. I'm doing everything. I go, do you want to get transferred? He goes, no. He goes, I go, what are you going to kill the guy with a $40? The guy, he disrespect me. And it, and it is the way in prison. I said, you made your point, you know. Leave it all alone. Don't get transferred. So he doesn't. But anyway, so now I have this fight with Bonnie. I'm in my cell. I got 10 days to go. In comes Reno. Comes into my cell. He goes, we got to kill Chief. We got to kill Chief. I go, what the f my whole life is fucking flashing in front of my eyes. Literally, I swear to you, my whole life is flashing in front of my eyes. I'm, what the? He goes, we're going to kill him. When he comes, when he comes in, I'll kill him. Goes, I'll come up behind you. You start the stab and I'll come up behind you. And I'm like, what the f*** is going on? I'm really, my whole life is flashing in front of my eyes. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm in f***ing a zoo. So sure enough, f***ing... The move comes, it's 8 o'clock, that's the night move, and here is 8 o'clock move, so it's the last move of the night, and I know Chief's coming up, and he comes, and sure enough, now in prison, you don't ever go into another man's cell, whether the door's open or not, you knock on the frame, you, now I got my shank out already, I'm ready to go, and no matter what happened, and I got my shank behind my leg, and my door is open, and I see a shadow coming down the tier now reno is out of my cell to just along the fucking tier like along the railing and the tier he's waiting I, he's just waiting for me to do so and fucking, i knock on the on the frame of the door and the chief goes 
like that. And I'll never forget. He goes, hey, he goes, he goes, Larry, you're good. He goes, it was Reno's fault. And obviously, Randy vouched for me that it wasn't my fault, all that shit that happened. I mean, he disrespected me, and I had to do what I did. Even though with 10 days left, I don't know if he did it because of that. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you how scared I was for 10 days. Every every single day, I had my shank on me. I didn't give a shit if I got caught. Not only that, I put my chair. We had these metal chairs. So I put the metal chair right in front of the door. So... If anybody opened the door quick and tried to run in, they would run into that chair and I would be ready. I was fucking on edge like you wouldn't believe. I'll never forget the most relieved I was was when they come at like one in the morning, they come to your door and they say, Lawton, pack up, you're leaving. It was like the biggest relief that I ever had that knocked out, you know, Lawton, pack up, you're leaving. And I'm ready to go and I and leave and I go down to the holding cells and it was like a big you know sigh of relief I'm leaving Atlanta I'm in the holding cell and I'm leaving Atlanta that's the end of chapter 10 I mean that's all three parts uh, you got chapter 10 brought back a lot of memories man pretty wild stuff uh, some good memories actually yeah they're all good memories in prison somebody asked me that and but some some pretty bad memories as well and but I'm gonna fight through it I'm really enjoying this I'm really liking the support thank you very much uh, you can listen to me read this chapter on Spotify and iTunes in the links below. Uh, please check out our shirts and merchandise and merch. I was told it's called merch. Please check it out, man. I'd love to you know, support us that way in any way you can. At 75,000 subscribers, which should be pretty soon, we're going to do another live one. I'm going to do another live show, and I think that should be pretty good. This time I'll know what I'm doing a lot more. Last time we had about 1,000 uh, people come on and watch the live show so we want to really break that number and uh, people can ask questions we're gonna have a moderator I really I really mean I love the support man please just think about the choices you make don't make the choices I made it's not worth it it really isn't uh, I had a rough life and I don't want anybody to have to go through what I did live live through me let let my hard times you know suffice to be your hard times just going through this stuff Hang in there, man. I can't wait to do the next chapter. That's chapter 11, which is Coleman and Jessup, my next two prisons. Uh, pretty good stuff there, too. Uh, thanks for the support. Please pass the word and uh, subscribe if you haven't. Uh, thanks a lot. Appreciate it.